Okay, so uh, last time I talked about fatty acid oxidation. Uh, I've only got one other topic to talk about with respect to fatty acid oxidation. Um, I hope you got the message last time about the considerations that are necessary for um, beta oxidation or, or for fatty acid oxidation when you have unsaturated fatty acids. And basically, what the cell is doing is it's taking those unsaturated fatty acids with cis bonds and orienting those bonds in the appropriate place and in the appropriate orientation, that is making them a trans bond, so that they can be uh, processed by the normal beta oxidation um, enzymes and uh, system. The other consideration we have for fatty acid oxidation um, is actually propionyl, uh, is propionic acid, so I need to say a word about that. Propionic acid is a three carbon fatty acid. How do we get a three carbon fatty acid? Well, there's a couple of ways. You can see some amino acids produce it. Valine also produces an intermediate of it in its um, degradation pathway. Uh, but the other way that you can get propionic acid or propionyl-CoA, same uh, thing for our purpose here, is by, is by beta oxidation of a fatty acid that contains an odd number of carbons. And so we've talked about fatty acids that have an even number of carbons. We're going to see today why um, those fatty acids have an even number of carbons. Uh, but there are occasional fatty acids that have an odd number of carbons. And so if we metabolize something that has an odd number of carbons, we will eventually get down to a three carbon piece of propionyl-CoA. Well, so it turns out that cells have to have a way to process this. And it's a, a very important thing. Genetic diseases that prevent the um, oxidation of propionic acid lead to uh, some severe problems. And so it's important that cells be able to do this. The pathway involved in uh, propionic acid metabolism is kind of odd, OK? Um, first of all, it requires uh, vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 is a cobalt-containing um, uh, coenzyme. And it's the only cobalt-containing molecule in your body. That's why cobalt is needed in extraordinarily tiny amounts. Cobalt's a poisonous material. Um, for uh, vitamin A, uh, I'm sorry, for, for vitamin B12-related uh, metabolism. This is one place where vitamin B12 is necessary uh, for uh, the body, to, for the cell to use. Okay, so if we look at what happens in propionic acid <coughs> or propionyl-CoA metabolism, we see that we've got a three-carbon intermediate right here, one, two, three carbons. And the, uh, what's happening is that this three-carbon intermediate is being processed into a four-carbon intermediate, succinyl-CoA, that can be used in the citric acid cycle. Okay? Beta oxidation will not, will not work on propionyl-CoA. The enzymes that handle that will not recognize that three carbon piece. So something has to be done to make it palatable for cells uh, to use. Well, the logical thing to do um, would be to take carbon dioxide and attach it to the end of the molecule and make a succinyl-CoA and everybody's happy and everything is done. It turns out that the cell actually doesn't do that. It, in fact, does an odd two-step, of which only one step is shown here. The first thing that the cell does is it puts the carbon dioxide onto uh, the propionyl-CoA in the middle carbon, not the end carbon. Further, it puts it on the other side of the, this carbon. So it's putting it on the wrong side in the first place. And then it says, oh, oops, I put it on the wrong side. I'm going to move it to this side. Okay, so it's going from an L to a D configuration because that's an asymmetric carbon. So there's two steps right there that the cell is going through in order to make succinyl-CoA. And after those two steps, it still doesn't have succinyl-CoA. It's in the third step that, that, succinyl, that the, the carbon dioxide is actually uh, placed on the end of the molecule. It's this rearrangement step in the middle where the vitamin B12 is needed. Okay? The rearrangement step in the middle where the vitamin B12 is needed. And that involves movement um, of a methyl group. And that movement of the methyl group um, is an unusual reaction. And that's why the cobalt is necessary uh, for that process. Well, suffice it to say that at the very end of this process, after those three steps uh, that actually occur, we end up with something, we end up with succinyl-CoA, 
which can then be oxidized in the citric acid cycle. Okay? So the upshot of that is that, um, as, a, as a consequence, three carbon pieces that result from beta oxidation or from um, amino acid metabolism can thus be oxidized in the citric acid cycle. And as I pointed out, this metabolic uh, process or this step uh, involves not only odd number uh, carbon uh, fatty acids, but also some amino acids that give intermediates uh, in this process. Okay, so that's what I want to say about oxidation. Um, I have a verse about oxidation that I uh, wrote that um, I'm not going to sing, but we will, uh, I will go through for you. And it goes as follows. In beta oxidation, it just occurred to me, the process all takes place between carbons 2 and 3. Some hydrogens are first removed to FADH2, then water adds across the bond the H to carbon 2. Hydroxyl oxidation is next, a ketone carbon 3. Then thiolase catalysis dissects the last two Cs. The products of the path, of course, are acetyl-CoA's, unless there were odd carbons, hence propionyl-CoA. So there's the pathway for you right there in, in a verse. Okay, well, um, you learn fatty acid oxidation, and fatty acid oxidation is uh, not a complicated pathway. There are four reactions uh, that are happening. And the good news for you when you go to learn fatty acid synthesis is that if you've learned the four steps in fatty acid oxidation, you know four of the five or so steps that are involved in fatty acid synthesis. And in fact, if we look at the synthesis pathway, which is shown in the uh, schematic uh, on the left here, it's part of it's shown, there's actually something that's missing, but the four relevant reactions that are uh, occurring on the pathway are shown on the left, and if you look at them, they are exactly the chemical opposite of the path of, of the steps happening in the oxidation. So if we start at the bottom, the very first step in the process uh, of fatty acid synthesis is a joining reaction. We put together molecules. In the oxidation pathway, the, the last step is a splitting reaction. This is where the thiolase was cutting apart stuff. We go up a step and we see that in fatty acid synthesis we have a reduction and that corresponds in fatty acid oxidation to an oxidation. Here we produce electrons, over here we need electrons. The next step up in the pathway involves a loss of water whereas in the oxidation we had a gain of water and the final step in the synthesis involves another reduction and in the first step of the oxidation of course that was an oxidation so we again produced electrons here and we needed electrons here if you look at the electron requiring reactions for fatty acid synthesis you do see some differences so first of all you have to have NADPH in order to um, synthesize fatty acids so NADPH is the source of electrons for both of the reduction reactions in fatty acid synthesis. If you look carefully at this as well, you'll see that in fatty acid oxidation, we have the molecules being oxidized attached to a coenzyme A. But if we look at the synthesis, we see that they're atta the, atta the molecule attached is something called ACP. So ACP stands for acyl carrier protein. Acyl carrier protein. Okay? An acyl carrier protein is the attachment molecule for synthesis. Another difference with fatty acid synthesis compared to oxidation is that fatty acid synthesis occurs in the cytoplasm. It occurs in the cytoplasm, whereas fatty acid oxidation, you recall, occurred in the mitochondrial matrix. And the last thing that I'll point out to you is a difference, and I'm going to show you these reactions in some more detail in a minute. But the last thing I pointed out as a, um, um, uh, an aspect of the fatty acid oxidation was that we formed, when we added that water, we had an L-shaped uh, an, um, an intermediate. When we do synthesis, that intermediate that we make is actually in the D configuration. All right? So those are the primary differences that occur between the two pathways. The difference um, 
uh, chemically is not significant because one is the reverse of the other, essentially. Now, as I said, there are, there are at least a couple of steps that lead up to this very first uh, step that we show here. So I want to spend a little time showing you how we get to the point of making fatty acids. So let's uh, take a look at that. The first step in the process for fatty acid synthesis is a very odd one. It's a very odd one. When we look at fatty acid synthesis, what we see is that each round of fatty acid synthesis produces or, or uses two carbons. And it's for that reason that fatty acids generally have an even number of carbons in them because 2 plus 2 is 4, 4 plus 2 is 6, 6 plus 2 is 8, etc. Okay? Um, but the molecule that's used to add those two carbons has three carbons. Okay? So that means that during the addition of the two carbon piece in fatty acid synthesis, one of those three carbons is lost. Okay? One of those three carbons is lost, and it's actually lost in that last figure. I'm not going to go back and show you, but if you look at that last figure, you'll see that carbon dioxide is lost in the first step of the synthesis of a fatty acid. Well, where does the three carbon piece come, come from? What is the nature of that three carbon piece? Well, the three carbon piece is uh, uh, synthesized by an enzyme known as acetyl-CoA carboxylase. This is one enzyme of the pathway that you should definitely know. Acetyl-CoA carboxylase. And that's the enzyme that's shown here on the screen. I'll show you the reaction in just a minute. But the enzyme is the only regulated enzyme in the synthesis of fatty acids. So we saw one regulated enzyme in the breakdown of fat, and that was the um, triacylglycerol lipase, none of the enzymes of beta oxidation were regulated, okay? And there's only one enzyme in the synthesis of fatty acids that's regulated, and it's this enzyme right here, acetyl-CoA carboxylase, all right? Now, let's talk about the regulation before we talk about the actual uh, reaction catalyzed by the enzyme. The Acetyl-CoA carboxylase is a, a very interesting enzyme in that it is regulated by two means. One means is shown here, and that is a phosphorylation. Putting a phosphate onto the enzyme uh, partially inactivates it. Partially inactivates it. Now this enzyme is as I said, an interesting enzyme because this is an enzyme that forms giant complexes when it's unphosphorylated. So the unphosphorylated form of the enzyme will make hundreds if not thousands of these linked together, or not, at least not linked, but associated together to make like a long fiber. Phosphorylation disrupts that fiber because the phosphates repel each other and the, in, the individual subunits of that fiber come apart. Okay? Well, those subunits can still be a little bit, I mean, they, those individual um, units can be a little bit active, which is why we say that phosphorylation only partly inhibits it. To fully inhibit the enzyme, allosteric interaction is necessary. And the allosteric effector, that is the molecule that inhibits this enzyme, um, is citrate. Okay? Citrate. Why am I looking at this from? Because I just said it wrong. That's why I'm looking. <laughs> I had to stop and think about it. It says, yeah, all right. As soon as I said citrate, I thought, well, that can't be right because citrate actually activates. And I'll tell you how I, how I re realized that in my head. So citrate is an activator, not an inactivator of the enzyme. And I apologize for that. The inactivator of the enzyme is not shown on here. The inactivator of the enzyme is an allosteric effector known as palmitate. So palmitic acid, the fatty acid palmitate, is the inhibitor of this enzyme. Okay? 
So if we have an enzyme that's phosphorylated and it's bound to palmitate, it will be completely inactivated. Now palmitic acid we're going to see is one of the end products of fatty acid synthesis. So as that starts to accumulate in the cell, it feedback inhibits its own synthesis by inhibiting this enzyme. Why does citrate partly activate that enzyme? All right. Well, the reason it partly activates it is as follows. We go back to metabolic control. Let's think about metabolic control. Let's say I've got the citric acid cycle going on in the mitochondrion. And I quit exercising. So from what you've learned so far, what's going to happen to my uh, concentration of ADP? Quit exercising, concentration of ADP goes what? Goes up, right? No, it goes down. Because ATP concentration is increasing. It was a, there was a trick question, guys. You say, I don't even know trick questions from Ahern today, right? Okay. ATP concentration goes up, ADP concentration goes down. When ADP concentration goes down, what happens to um, oxidative phosphorylation? Down, right? No oxidative phosphorylation, what happens to the proton gradient? Up. Proton gradient up, what happens to um, NADH concentration? Up. NADH concentration up, what happens to NAD concentration? Down. NAD concentrate, we're getting there. NAD concentration down, what happens to citric acid cycle? Down. So citric acid cycle is going to slow slash stop. What's the first reaction of the citric acid cycle that needs NAD? Turns out it's isocitrate dehydrogenase. Okay. How do we get isocitrate? We get isocitrate from citrate, right? And we remember that the first reaction of the citric acid cycle, that is that citrate synthase reaction, was very favorable. Putting an acetyl-CoA onto the oxaloacetate was a very favorable reaction. Which means that even though the other things are stopping, what's happening to the production of citrate? It's going up. It's increasing. So what happens to citrate concentration in the mitochondrial matrix? Going up. Now, this is why you want to exercise, guys. Because when your citrate concentration goes up inside of your mitochondrial matrix, there's a little transporter that will take that citrate out of the matrix and put it out into the cytoplasm. And when it gets out into the cytoplasm, there's an enzyme that will take citrate and do the reverse reaction that it just went through for synthesis. That is, it'll produce oxaloacetate and acetyl-CoA. When acetyl-CoA concentration starts going up in the cytoplasm, fatty acid synthesis goes up. Any citrate that is not broken down binds and activates this enzyme. So when we're not exercising, we're activating this enzyme. And we're moving citrate and thus acetyl-CoA out into the cytoplasm where fatty acid synthesis can occur. This is why exercise is a very important consideration in obesity. That makes sense? I see some yeses. Okay. Questions about that? Okay. Now, Notice this phosphorylation is catalyzed by an enzyme called an AMP activated protein kinase. That is not, that is not the um, protein kinase A that we've talked about before. Okay? This is an AMP activated protein kinase. What do you suppose an AMP protein, uh, I'm sorry, AMP activated kinase would be important for? Besides obviously making, putting a phosphate on here. Why would that be an important consideration for a cell? What's AMP an indicator of? Low energy. When you have low energy, do you want to be synthesizing fatty acids? Nope. So when the cell is getting AMP, what's it doing? It's turning off fatty acid synthesis. Okay. Very important for the cell to be able to control that relating to its energy. Phosphatase takes the phosphate off, and that phosphatase will be activated when the cell gets additional energy.
Okay. So, the reactions, and oh, I thought, yeah, I thought I had a reaction showing the formation of this, but I don't. So, the reaction is catalyzed by the acetyl CoA carboxylase is simply the following acetyl CoA plus carbon dioxide yields malonyl CoA. And there's the extra carbon dioxide put on the end of it, right there on the left side. Okay? Malonyl CoA is the three carbon intermediate that is used to add two carbons to the fatty acid during synthesis and the two carbons are coming from uh, carbon number one and carbon number two right there. That's carbon number three right there. Okay. So this guy gets added on and then we're going to see this guy, this carbon dioxide that got added on is dropped. So it doesn't even enter the final equation in the synthesis of the fatty acid. Well, what's happening in this reaction, or these reactions? We see two things happening. First of all, we see a malonyl-CoA being converted into a malonyl-ACP. Acyl carrier protein, I told you, was the handle that's used in fatty acid synthesis. Okay? Acetyl-CoA is being converted into acetyl-ACP. And you're saying, why in the hell do you need acetyl-CoA? You just told us you needed to have a three-carbon intermediate. Well, we're going to see that the very first reaction involves a two carbon intermediate plus a three, split out of carbon dioxide and make a four. So this is actually necessary for the very first reaction. So an acetyl ACP is necessary for the very first reaction. The enzyme catalyzing this has a general name we call transacylase. Okay? And in both cases, the um, uh, reaction is the same, just a different starting material. Okay. Yep. Went to the wrong thing. All right. Now, here's that very first reaction that's occurring. Here's our acetyl ACP. Here's the malonyl ACP. And by the way, I'm going to give you a shortcut name for all these enzymes, so don't worry about the enzyme names at this point. Okay? We see loss of an ACP because we have two and we're going to end up with one. So we lose an ACP and we lose a carbon dioxide. And that carbon dioxide is the one that got added on by the, by the um, uh, acetyl-CoA carboxylase. The result of that is we have a four carbon intermediate whose name we're not going to worry about. Okay? It's actually acetoacetyl ACP, but that's fine. You don't need to worry about that. And um, that four carbon intermediate then is the substrate for the subsequent reactions for the synthesis. All right, so let's go to the next reaction in that synthetic pathway. The next reaction, oh, why do I keep going down to that one? The next reaction in the pathway is shown here. <coughs> Excuse me. This involves the first reduction. This reduction takes electrons from NADPH, puts them onto this carbonyl group here, to make a hydroxyl, and that hydroxyl now creates an asymmetric carbon, and as I mentioned earlier, that hydroxyl is in the D configuration, which is in contrast to the hydroxyl of oxidation, which is in the L configuration. So here it's in the D configuration. Okay, so we're just tracing backwards now chemically the same steps that we saw in oxidation. Instead of having an uh, oxidation, we're having a reduction, and the electrons are coming from NADPH. The next step in the process involves loss of water. The equivalent reaction in the oxidation involved the gain of water. Well, if we have a hydroxyl and we have a proton and we pull them out across the single bond, we create a double bond. We again create a trans intermediate like we saw in the fatty acid oxidation. Okay? And again, all these enzyme names, don't worry about them. I'm going to give you a shortcut for all of them. And the next step in the process, we go up here and we take that double bond. We reduce it with two electrons and two protons coming from NADPH again. And now we have a molecule that has four carbons. It's fully reduced out here on this end. That had a double bonded oxygen to start and we've completely reduced that double bonded oxygen now to a carbon with two hydrogens. This four carbon intermediate 
becomes the substrate to which two more carbons are added in the next reaction. So if I take this four carbon intermediate and I combine it with malonyl CoA, I'm going to make something that has six carbons and I'll just start the whole process over. So I have that six carbon intermediate. I'll reduce the, um, the ketone, make a hydroxyl, pull out the water, reduce the double bond, and I'll have a six carbon intermediate just like this. So every cycle that I go through that I've just described to you, of which this is the very first one here, every cycle I go through adds two more carbons, which is again why we have an even number of carbons in fatty acid synthesis. Okay? And um, it all occurs in a big complex. I'm showing these as individual enzyme names, but it turns out there's a saving grace for you. The complex that catalyzes this reaction has all of these activities in one enzyme. It looks like this. Okay? It looks like this. This some people describe this as kind of like a clock, and this is a hand that moves to these various areas. Each of these little abbreviations corresponds to um, a, um, a catalytic activity. And so these molecules are just simply moved around from one place to another on this enzyme in order for the catalysis to occur. So some people used to describe this as a clock, and we saw that the clock would spin kind of like this. Okay so that at each various place, say 10 o'clock, 8 o'clock, 6 o'clock, etc., a different catalytic activity would occur, and those are sequentially maintained as I described to you, right? We have the joining, the reduction, removal of water, reduction of the double bond. The joining, the removal of water, we just continue that process over and over. The beauty is we're going to call all those enzyme activities, except for acetyl-CoA carboxylase, we're going to call all of those other enzyme activities by one name, fatty acid synthase. Doesn't get any simpler than that. Fatty acid synthase catalyzes all of those individual reactions that I just described to you. Now fatty acid synthase structure is maintained all the way from bacteria to humans. So it says this structure is very efficient, very useful, and probably also very important. Okay? So this structure is maintained through all of the, the, the uh, basic biology. Okay, I'm not going to ask you where things are on there, so don't worry about that. I'm simply showing you the complex to tell you that there is one. All right? Okay. Well, fatty acid synthase is a great enzyme. It works in the cytoplasm and it produces fatty acids up to 16 carbons long. And 16 carbon fatty acids, I hope you remember, are palmitic acid. And palmitic acid was the allosteric inhibitor of the acetyl-CoA carboxylase. So we can think of palmitic acid as one of the endpoints of fatty acid synthesis. Now I say it's one of the endpoints because we make other fatty acids, but they take other processes in other places in the cell. Okay? Palmitic acid is a saturated fatty acid. And we know that we have unsaturated fatty acids in our cells, so we have to have a way of making unsaturated fatty acids, and I'll explain that briefly in a second. We know that we also have longer fatty acids than 16 carbons, and we have to have a way of making those as well. Well, that's what's referred to in this figure here. So fatty acids longer than 16 are made in the endoplasmic reticulum and, interestingly, in the mitochondrial matrix. Why would we have oxidation and synthesis going on in the same place? I can't answer that question, but I can tell you something that you already know that relates to this. Does anybody know what I'm alluding to? An enzyme that I mentioned yes, or on Monday. 
It had three forms. Acyl-CoA dehydrogenase. Long, short, and medium, right? Where did you find the long one? You didn't find it in the mitochondrial matrix. You found it in the... Okay? Breakdown of the long ones start in the peroxisome. That's because you don't want the breakdown of the long ones and the synthesis of the long ones occurring in the same place, the mitochondrial matrix. The reason that guy's in the peroxisome is because synthesis of long ones can occur in the matrix. It separates them. It's an odd scheme. All I can say is that's the end product. I can't tell you why, but I can tell you that's how the cell evolved to do that. All right. So the endoplasmic reticulum and the mitochondrion are the sites of longer fatty acid synthesis. And I'm going to give you something that's going to be a good simplifier for you. We give those enzymes that do that catalysis a single name. They're called elongases. Elongases. And like you've already seen, they add fatty acids, I'm sorry, they add uh, carbons two at a time onto that fatty acid. So you still have even numbered fatty acids. Okay? All right. Unsaturated fatty acids are made by enzymes called desaturases, and they're found in the endoplasmic reticulum as well. Now, desaturases simply take a saturated fatty acid and remove two protons, two electrons, and create a cis bond. Okay? Desaturases found in our cells, I mentioned this before, don't work past delta 9. Go back to the delta and omega numbering system. They don't work past delta 9. Meaning that if we want to put a cis double bond further than 9 carbons away from the carboxyl group, we can't do it. What does that mean? It means that we can make oleic acid, which has a double bond at position 9, and we, use, we make a lot of oleic acid, but we can't make linoleic acid because it has double bonds at positions 9 and 12. Since we can't make it, we have to have it in our diet, and linoleic acid, as a consequence, is an essential fatty acid. We have to have it in our diet because we can't make it and we need it. Linolenic acid is also in that category. Okay? So we can make some of the unsaturated fatty acids that we need, but we can't make all of them. Okay. I have a verse for this as well. For fatty acid synthesis, I must reverse the path of breaking fatty acids, though you'll wonder about the math. A cycle of addition occurs with carbons 1, 2, 3. Yet products of reactions number carbons evenly. The reason is that CO2 plays peekaboo-like games by linking to an at coa then popping off again. Reactions are like oxidation, except they're backwards here. Reduction, dehydration, then two hydrogens appear. The product of the process is a 16-carbon chain. The bonds are saturated. No double ones remain. For them, desaturases toil to put in links of cis in animals to delta 9, but no more go past this. And last, there's making longer ones, icosanoidic fun. They're made by elongases in the E reticulum. Okay, so now you've got synthesis as well. Well, I'm going to show you some reactions now that I've been talking about for a couple of lectures, or at least a couple of lectures ago, but I haven't shown you the reactions. And these relate to the synthesis primarily of the prostaglandins, the prostagens, okay? I told you that arachidonic acid is a molecule that you don't want floating around much in the cell because in the cell it readily gets converted into the prostagens and that can have some consequences, pain and so forth. So the cell wants to control when the, uh, uh, those uh, 20 carbon intermediates, the arachidonic acid, are released. Well, 20 carbon arachidonic acid is locked up in the cell in glycerophospholipids. It's locked up in glycerophospholipids. And where do we find these? These are in the membrane. Well, in order to release arachidonic acid, there's a lipase that is necessary. It's called a phospholipase. Okay. 
A phospholipase is different than a lipase that breaks down fat because a fat doesn't have a phosphate group. So a phospholipase will work on glycerophospholipids. And you can see various phospholipases operating in different places. I don't care that you know the names of those except for phospholipase A2. Because that's the one that releases arachidonic acid from a glycerophospholipid in the cell. That's how the cell gets free arachidonic acid when it needs to make prostagins. Okay? So the cell has activated phospholipase A2 and it releases that. Okay? Um, an overview of the process is shown here. And you'll notice that there's leukotrienes on here. Some people asked, you, asked me a while back about leukotrienes and arachidonic acid. And I said, yes, it's possible to make them from arachidonic acid. But it's also possible to make them from other sources like linolenic acid and so forth. And that's not shown on here. We're not going to focus on this. We're going to focus on the left side of this um, because there's some important uh, considerations uh, for us here. Okay. First of all, we have to have the release of the arachidonic acid from the glycerophospholipid, and that's shown up here. And the one that we're interested in here is the phospholipase A2, since that's the primary source of the um, uh, arachidonic acid. The arachidonic acid, you recall, is converted into prostagins by action of enzymes known as cyclooxygenases. That's what I call the COX enzymes, COX-1 or COX-2. There are different ones. Okay. And there's a peroxidase, as I'll show you in just a bit. And that creates a very important prostaglandin called prostaglandin H2. This enzyme, by the way, is also called PGH2 synthase because the molecule produced in this is prostaglandin H2. So you can use PGH2 synthase, you can use COX-1, COX-2, uh, whichever of those that you, and you can also call it just cyclooxygenase as well. They all are the same thing that's producing the prostaglandin H2. Prostaglandin H2 is important because it is the precursor of the other prostaglandins. It also is a precursor of a class of molecules called the prostacyclins, which I haven't talked about and which I won't. And it's also a precursor of thromboxane, which I noted was important for blood clotting. Okay. Now, um, if I take something like aspirin, what aspirin does is it is a suicide inhibitor of this enzyme right here. That is the cyclooxygenase. It's a suicide inhibitor. And I hope last term what you learned about suicide inhibitors are that these are molecules that look like the normal substrate. They bind at the active site, but they form a covalent bond so that they can't be removed from the enzyme. Aspirin is actually going in and covalently bonding with this enzyme and preventing the conversion of arachidonic acid into the precursor of all of these molecules. Uh, well, they are irreversible inhibitors, but their the, they're, they're common name is that they're suicide inhibitors because what happens is the enzyme commits suicide by binding to them. Okay, but, but thanks. But that's what, they're, that's what they're called, are suicide inhibitors. They are irreversible because of the covalent bond. Okay. All right, well that's one way of stopping these things from being produced. There's another way of stopping the production of prosta, uh, prostaglandins. And this other way involves inhibiting phospholipase A2. Phospholipase A2 can be inhibited by steroids. Okay, so when you see people that are, that are taking cortisol, Okay, or cortisone to prevent pain and swelling, what they're doing is that they're inhibiting the action of this enzyme and thereby inhibiting the production of all of this stuff. And this is, in fact, a more effective way of reducing the production of the prostaglandins because you don't have to worry about killing the enzyme. You don't even have the substrate when you do that. The downside, of course, is that steroids have many other negative effects, so we don't routinely give steroids as an inhibitor of the phospholipase A2. Okay? I had um, a thing when I first came to Oregon back in the dark ages, 1981, 
I went out and I discovered Oregon had these incredible blackberries, right? Everybody goes out blackberries, especially when you first get to Oregon. They grow wild, right? You love blackberries. You go out. And I went out and I picked blackberries and I got like this ton of blackberries. And I went out, it was a hot summer day and I'm wearing my shorts, right? And I don't even know what poison oak looks like, right? <laughs> oh my God. That night I get this kind of, eh, what is that kind of itch, right? And, you know, I get, I had poison oak on my leg like nobody's business. I was probably bathing in it, picking berries as just dumb as I could possibly be, not knowing go, what's going on, right? Well, the leg starts swelling and swelling, and my leg got literally to twice its normal size. And the, I went to the doctor, and the doctor says, that doesn't look good. And it was the only time I ever got put on steroids uh, to reduce the swelling and so forth, because they were concerned that it would, in fact, uh, uh, become gangrenous, which wasn't uh, a very good move. So their steroids were certainly justified to do that. Okay. I told you before what NSAIDs are, and NSAIDs are molecules that inhibit the cyclooxygenase, aspirin being one of them, and ibuprofen being the other. And somebody, people always ask me at this point, is ibuprofen a suicide inhibitor as well? I believe it is, but I'm not sure of that. I'm not sure if it's a suicide inhibitor as well, but aspirin is definitely a suicide inhibitor of the cyclooxygenase. But they're both in the same category, they're both NSAIDs. Tylenol, the active ingredient in Tylenol works differently than these two. It does not work on the same enzyme. It works on it in a completely different mechanism than uh, either of these do. So um, Tylenol is a different kind of a painkiller. Okay, well I've got just a couple of minutes. Let me just mention obesity. Um, obesity is a big topic in the news and when we look at obesity worldwide, we see no surprise that Americans are very obese. Uh, especially can, compared to most countries uh, in the world in terms of percentages. And I won't go into the hows, whys. I think since I've been talking so much about exercise and fatty acids, you guys can get an idea about what I'm coming from. Obesity uh, is a complicated topic. Um, we want, I think the tendency is for people to want to be able to think about this in simple terms. Um, and there aren't simple answers either to the cause, although exercise and amount eaten are probably two of the biggest, but um, the reduction of weight and maintenance of weight is a much more complicated topic. Things that affect the obesity of an individual include uh, these um, hormones up above known as adipokine, uh, uh, adipokines, and adipokines are peptide hormones, meaning that they're protein hormones that are found in fat tissue, fat cells, okay? Um, they're relatively recently discovered, meaning in the last 20 years. And when they discovered the first one of these called leptin, they thought they had the answer because with leptin, they found that animals that were deficient in leptin became extremely obese. I think I've shown a figure in here already of a mouse that was deficient in leptin. It was very, very obese, okay? They also know of people who had defects in leptin, and they also had very uh, big problems with, with obesity. And so the thinking was that if we could um, fix the leptin problems, we would have the perfect diet drug. Well, it turns out to be much more complicated than that. But what we do know about leptin uh, is that leptin is involved in the hunger response. The hunger response, okay? Leptin suppresses, okay, hunger. So if you could have leptin doing its thing, okay, you, you stimulate leptin, you're not going to be hungry, you're going to eat less, you're going to lose weight, et cetera, et cetera, and in theory that's how it works. It turns out in people that doesn't work so simply, okay? It doesn't work so simply, but it does play a role in appetite. Leptin is countered by another peptide hormone called ghrelin. And ghrelin stimulates hunger. So leptin depresses hunger. Ghrelin stimulates hunger. Ghrelin works in the hypothalamus and it gets secreted in your gut. Okay? This is kind of cool. When the gut is full, ghrelin can't make it across the gut, can't get in the bloodstream, can't make it back to the hypothalamus, and you're not hungry. Okay? Before you eat, you got an empty gut. 
And it appears to be the stretching of the gut that prohibits the movement of ghrelin. Because when the gut is contracted, that's when ghrelin makes it out and makes it into the bloodstream, goes to the hypothalamus and says, hey, stupid, you're hungry. Right? So that's the difference between ghrelin, which stimulates the uh, appetite, and leptin, which um, depresses it. Leptin is made in fat cells. It's not made in the gut. Okay. Okay. Well, that's a lot of stuff. I do have um, one song for you today to drive home the message. So let's do our song. It's to the same tune as we sang last time. Oop, what happened to my thing there? It's called when acids are synthesized. It's in carbon fatty acid palmitate. Gets all the carbons that it needs from acetate, which citric acid helps release from mitochondria matrices. Oh, a shuttle's great when acids are synthesized. Carboxylase takes substrate and it puts within. Dioxycarbon carried on a biotin. Coase all gain a quick release, replaced by larger ACPs, and it all begins when acids are synthesized. A malinate contributes to the growing chain. Two carbon seven times around again, again. For saturated acylates, there's lots of NADPH that you must obtain when acids are synthesized. Palmitic acid made this way all gets released. Desaturases act to make omega-3s. The finished products, big and small, form esters with a glycerol. So you get obese when acids are synthesized. All right, guys. See you on Friday. <laughs>